question I get or see on, on email trays, uh, trails is, why would you want to be a participating provider to a Medicare Advantage organization? I saw this recently in a uh, trail of, of questions I was asked. It was uh, a question about a Medicare Advantage organization. One of the doctors who was trying to help out was, said, why would you ever participate? So I thought that that would be a good, good question to discuss today. But I, I'd like to start and make sure we're on a common background. Um, I know this is going to be basic for some of you, but we'll, we'll just make sure we have the basics. Um, that Medicare Advantage organizations are not Medicare supplemental plans. They are actually administering the Medicare benefit, not just the cost sharing part of it. They do have to cover all Part A and Part B benefits. And I always seem to generate questions about that, so I'll, I'll expect one. Um, they have to comply with all the local coverage decisions and national coverage decisions when they're reviewing coverage. And also, I think people forget that most state laws regulating the plans are preempted as they apply to Medicare Advantage plans. It's just licensure laws and solvency laws are the only state laws that apply. The plans, whether you're participating or non-participating, have a lot of flexibility beyond fee-for-service. They can impose utilization review features like referral requirements or prior authorization that aren't required under original Medicare. They can review medical necessity in instances in which Medicare fee-for-service automatically makes payment. And I know we've had this come up with diabetic shoes where one was denied because even though Medicare fee-for-service would have paid it because it was in the right time period and it was a covered benefit, the plan decided to actually make sure the member needed new diabetic shoes. Um, they can also choose to cover benefits beyond Part A and Part B, supplemental type benefits. It's also very important to kind of understand that there are multiple types of Medicare Advantage plans and different rules apply to different types of plans. Um, HMOs, of course, and most of them in the Medicare Advantage world do have closed networks. Some of them will have a point of service benefit where they will just allow you to go outside of the network for one or two, a small range of benefits. There are local PPOs that work like most PPOs that that you know of, and then regional PPOs that are a little looser on the access standards. They tend to rely more on non-contracted providers and they cover a whole region. And of course, we see very few of the medical savings accounts with the high deductible plans and the private fee-for-service plans, which are slowly seeming to fade out. Um, but your rights and obligations depend on what type of plan it is. And every membership card now that you have from a Medicare Advantage member will state exactly what type of plan it is. So you can be in network, you can be out of network, or you can be a deemed provider, which is, is kind of a hybrid between in network and out of network. Deemed providers furnish services to private fee-for-service um, members. And when they do that, they're automatically deemed to accept the plan's terms and conditions. It's a hybrid because you can decide with patient X today, I will be a deemed provider. With patient Y, I won't. Or, and, and if you decide you don't want to be de deemed provider, you, you can't provide services to that member if they're in a private fee-for-service plan. So it's, it's a day-by-day, patient-by-patient decision if you are working with a private fee-for-service plan and you decide you're not happy with the timeliness of the reimbursement or they're asking for too many records, you can just quit seeing their members and you're no longer subject for future services um, to those requirements. When you are a Medicare Advantage provider, either in network or out of network, there are several resources to look at what your rights are. If you're a contracted provider, your rights are usually in the law and that written contract. And if you're a non-contracted provider, it's just in the law, you're not subject to the contract. 
deemed providers, it's in the law and the plan's terms and conditions. This is the pseudo contract that you're deemed to accept every time you see a private fee for service member. So the pros and cons of, of contracting with Medicare Advantage organizations. Um, I had to think hard for the pros, <laughs> but there are some. I mean, if the Medicare Advantage organization is an HMO, there's no other way to get paid um, for seeing their members. It's a closed network. There's also the opportunity to get referrals. Uh, even if it's an open network plan, all contracts that I see make the providers agree to only refer to network providers. The member can go out of network, but the network providers can only refer to other network providers. And this is just a safeguard to make sure members don't end up with higher cost sharing than they expect. But there is that referral issue. Um, I am seeing, and, and you may see, there are all these really interesting initiatives to get risk adjustment data, to perform better on star ratings. There are all these consulting companies coming in and coming up with new ways to get data out of the contracting providers. And sometimes those new ways involve new funds. So there are opportunities to participate in quality incentive or data collection programs for additional payment. There is the opportunity to negotiate a payment amount that's greater than Medicare fee for service. It's an opportunity if you're in a big practice is probably more likely for you or if you're in a place with where there's a provider shortage it's uh, probably more likely, but I've seen it a couple times in the last couple weeks. Um, plans paying 102 and 103 percent of the Medicare rate to their providers because they needed to put together a network. Uh, this one is, is much easier, is negotiating a favorable recoupment or audit provision in your contract. It's, it's fairly open-ended under Medicare fee-for-service. It's about four years you can look back. Um, you can get a better term than that under your, your provider contract. Most plans, with a little pushing, um, will limit it to a year or 18 months. You can ask for audits to only be done with a certain amount of notice, and um, you can ask that they pay for the records. You can get those contractually. Um, and you might be paid more promptly as a participating provider. So the cons are mostly unfavorable contract provisions, which we commonly see. Um, the one that's most frustrating is asking you to provide records for any reason at no cost to the plan. Um, certainly complying with onerous prior authorization requirements gets old. You may not get a, pay, a favorable payment rate. Uh, the plan is perfectly welcome to impose its own downcoding, its own edit rules. They do not have to pay like Medicare fee for service if you are a contracting provider. If you are contracting, the only available appeal process to you is the process that's established by the plan. And that's not regulated. It's really up to the plan to come up with its own process. And usually those are one level processes, not in all cases, but it's usually not not in your favor. Um, if, you, if payment is denied by the plan, there's a hold harmless clause in your contract that will keep you from billing the beneficiary for that denied payment. And based on new CMS guidance, it may be very difficult to furnish non-covered benefits to members, even if they agree to pay out of pocket. So if the plan did not cover orthotics, for example, it would be very hard to um, provide those even if you got them to agree in advance. Um, CMS has recently told plans providers can't give, your contracting providers cannot give advanced beneficiary notice. That does not apply under Medicare Advantage. Um, the only way that they can provide a non-covered benefit is to ask for authorization and be denied. As long as the member gets a denial notice, then the member can be billed. So obviously that puts another step in the way of trying to provide a non-covered service to a member. Um, on the other side, the pros of non-contracting. Uh, 
If you're a non-contracting provider, the Medicare Advantage organization is required to pay you in the same amount and manner as original Medicare. They're going to recognize the same modifiers, you're going to see the same coding rules, and you should be paid the same amount. Um, an unfortunate thing that happened at the beginning of the year, CMS used to have an external review process where if you had a question about how much you had been paid and you thought it wasn't what you would have been paid under fee-for-service, you would ask the plan about it first and then you could appeal it to this independent entity. But CMS ran out of money for that independent entity and that process is no longer available. So you can just go to the plan now. Um, if you are a non-contracting provider, there's no obligation to furnish records for purposes of risk adjustment. And I, that is a narrow. You still have to furnish records to prove medical necessity. That's required under Medicare. If they ask for medical, to do medical review, you still have to furnish those records or they have a right not to pay you for the service. But risk adjustment, and you see a lot of requests for risk adjustment data. Um, you can, if you're willing to, to provide the records, you can ask for payment for doing so, for your administrative services, for the copying, et cetera. You have no obligation just to do that. Um, you also, as a non-contracted provider, have access to the member appeal process. You just fill out a form saying that if you lose, you will hold the member harmless, and you'll appeal first with the plan, then it'll go to an independent review entity, and then it goes through the regular Medicare appeal process, an administrative law judge, and the Medicare Appeals Council. But you have that external appeal access, which you don't have when you're a contract at providers. For PPOs and private fee-for-service plans, they cannot require referrals or prior authorization. Um, in order to receive services from non-network providers. So you don't have to deal with that either. There are some downsides to being a non-contracting provider. Um, if it's an HMO, again, you're not gonna get plan reimbursement for services. And this is an issue we, we uh, talk a lot about a lot with APMA members. Unless prior authorization, you is voluntarily requested by you. You decide you're going to call in and see something's going to be covered, then they're only going to review medical ne necessity after the services are furnished and, and they may retroactively take your payment. What I want to say about this, because we've all seen those documents with an authorization number that say authorization is no guarantee of payment. And I, I talk to people who are pulling their hair out about it and say, well, what is a guarantee in payment? If you say the magic words, I'd like an organization determination, and those are the words, um, then they have to give you a binding determination. If you ask for authorization, you'll get an authorization number, and they will not have an obligation to, to honor that. If you ask for an organization determination, you may have to provide them medical records. You've just asked them to, to tell you that the service is medically necessary. And an organization determination is binding unless for some reason they reopen it and they have to have good cause for reopening it. Um, as a non-contracting provider, you can be subject to recoupments and audits up to four years after payment of claims. There's no chance to negotiate that window any smaller. And of course, there's, there's not that referral stream from plan providers. 